Thank you very much and lovely to be in this rather wonderful room and, in, and to be in Prague. Thank you for the invitation. Um, so what I'm talking about today is how to evaluate a corpus. Um, so the a central theme of linguistics in the 21st century is to use corpus evidence. So a straightforward response to that from any sort of branch of science might be, well, what data are you going to use? We want to use, we want to use data. It's quite novel for linguistics to use data. It's a bit obvious in most of the scientific world to use data. Um, so that, it's not going to surprise them when it says, we use data now, they're more likely to say, well, what data? If we move on, if we continue, there's a similar kind of question for natural language processing, language technology. Um, what we all do now in NLP is learn from data, um, so the same question applies. Well, which data? Um, there's two situations where you might have that question. The first is where you know what the target text, text type is that you want to describe or that you want to buy an build an application for. So if you know what, if, you, if you've got a clear idea of what text type you're in, then it's sort of clear that you want the data that best matches that text type. But that's not the situation I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about the situation where the text type isn't known, where we want to do something about general language. Now that's usually what we want to do. Think, uh, that's usually what we want to talk about in linguistics. You know, linguistics is really wants to find out what the structures of the of the grammatical constituent and the grammatical constituent constituents of a language are. It doesn't really want to ask what are the grammatical constitu constituents of in newspaper text. It wants to ask a broader question than that. So that's the usual situation in linguistics, and. Um, particularly the situation in lexicography where it's a central principle of general language lexicography that you want to cover the whole language, you want to cover all the words of the language. Um, also, in, so, also in language technology, um, mostly we would like our part of speech taggers and parsers and other tools to apply to the general language. Um, you know, that's what Google tries to do when it wants to translate on, um, on uh, in, using Google Translate. It wants to cover whatever you happen to serve it, whatever genre it's of. Um, also for lexical acquisition, you've got the, you sort of replicate the same process there. So this is our topic. How do we evaluate a corpus according to how, how good it is for studying and building tools for general language? Um, here's, a ni here's a nice blank slide describing the prior work. Uh, I really haven't found anything much that talks about how you decide what's a good corpus for a task using anything other than we thought it looked about right. So really, we're in uh, the, um, there's a certain amount of prior work for this one. When the target type is known, people do things like finding a corpus that has the uh, highest or lowest, I can never remember, cross entropy for the, for the target domain. So where the target, where you know what it is you want to, where you know what type of text, where you've got a good sized sample of the kind of text you want to go for, that's a pretty under-researched but reasonably familiar problem. It's certainly a very common practical problem. Where it's not, that's the one where I really have had great trouble finding any prior work at all. Um, a standard response to um, that the people have given me to evaluating a corpus was, is kind of roughly, well it all depends on the task um, and uh, what's a good corpus for one task won't necessarily be a good corpus for another task and I can certainly and I, I don't disagree with that 
but given the complete absence of, um, of ways to go about the challenge, my feeling is we should start somewhere. So until this proved, my working hypothesis is what's a good general language corpus for one task is a, gen is a good general language corpus for all. I'm clearly going to be willing to stand down when there's counter evidence, but let's start off from that basis. Um, and we, here's, here are some reasons why there's, there might be quite a lot to that approach, because whatever task we're doing in lang linguistic description or in lexicography or in language technology and tool building, we can kind of agree that a big corpus is good and a diverse corpus is good if we want to cover the general language and that duplicates are bad and that junk, stuff that isn't really part of that language at all is bad. So um, these are fairly raw, broad, rough ideas that mean we're all gonna, anyone working in linguistics or language technology is going to have some of the same agenda about what makes a good corpus and what doesn't. Um, I first, I sort of started getting engaged in this question, passing over this question, um, around about 2000, I guess. But then it was, um, then it was a bit of an abstract consideration. In 2000, if you wanted to use a corpus for language research, well, in English we had the British National Corpus. I guess the Czech National Corpus first version was. Was, yeah, that was just about then, so good date to have chosen. So, we, hooray, we've got a corpus, we can do it. You know, there's not much point saying what, what's a good one and what's not, because there's only one that you can use. So back in 2000, it wasn't really a very immediate, it wasn't a pressing question, because you didn't actually have any choice. Um, two, oh, I'm out of data. 2014, the situation's quite different for, for Czech. You've got chest, chest two, I think... Am I right? That's the one they've made in Brno, and this one is from the, from the Czech National Corpus Group. Is that? Yeah. Um, and then in Brno, we've also, or the, my company's made the 1010 Corpus, and the people in Leipzig, um, Uli Kastroff and colleagues, have generated corpora for lots of languages. So now there's those kind of um, corpora with names, and also you can build your own corpus. So. There's lots of, you know, I'm, from the nods I see some people here involved in building their own corpora of whatever sizes. So, um, so we'd like some idea of, of we, we, want, we need to be able to evaluate a corpora to work out what parameters we should use for these corpus building processes. I should say, do feel free to interrupt and disagree or tell me to slow down if I start talking too fast at any point. I'm very happy for it to be... Uh, dialogue-like. Um, in language technology, we've got used to, uh, to the distinction between two different ways to do evaluation, intrinsic and extrinsic. Intrinsic means we'll be assessing features of the, of the corpus itself. Um, its size, its conformity to some formalism, those sorts of things. Extrinsic was a quite a different kind of assessment. Um, does it help you do some task better? This is the sort of more straightforward to do because you don't need to look outside the corpus to see how good it is. We're, but um, it's more straightforward. But by general agreement, it's intrinsic is quite limited. It doesn't really tell you whether it's good for any good for tasks and that's really what you want to know. So it's more convincing if we can do an extrinsic evaluation. Um, and we'd like so we so we we want to use a, we want to see evaluate a corpus by seeing how good it is to do some task. The next question is what task might be suitable. So we'd like it to be a task a broad coverage task for general language as um, Patrick Hank's recent book has sort of given a good theory of why we need always to be thinking about the norms of the language and the norms of the language, you know, the full set of norms of the language are only going to, are only, you know, that, that's kind of what we as linguists should be addressing and dealing with. Um, it needs to be sensitive to the quality of the corpus. We'd like it to have not too many dependencies. 
Um, some, sometimes the problem with extrinsic evaluations is you've got this small module in this great long processing chain and you can get some results which are more or less good out at the end of the chain when you change this module but you sometimes end up a bit unconvinced that the changes that you saw right over there were due to the changes in the module here because there are so many other interactions along the way. So we'd quite like it to be a task without too many complex dependencies, not depending on, on too many other complex modules, and we'd like it to be valuable. So that was the goal for this initiative. And the task that we're the task that we've come up with is collocation dictionary creation. Um, so, the ide on the premise that an ideal corpus combined with ideal software along the way would enable us to produce a collocations dictionary, something like the Oxford Collocations Dictionary, um, which has had a couple of editions now um, for English. It would, be, it would enable us to produce that dictionary automatically. That's what we'd like to be able to do. There's an example from it, verb demonstrate. Um, these are the adverbs that, are in, that often modify demonstrate. We amply demonstrate things, we demonstrate them beyond doubt, we demonstrate them clearly. Um, here, um, uh, and it's often, uh, uh, it's often with preposition to demonstrate to the country that he's really in control um, and uh, we've also got oh we haven't got we've just got adverbs and prepositions here we haven't got any nouns so that is kind of it's it's sort of plausible. These are, these are patterns with a verb that are the kinds of things that we can identify automatically from big corpus. So it's kind of some sort of it's kind of thing that we we can do to some extent, and possibly we can do very well as technologists. Um, so what our so what we're going to do is to say here are the collocations that the tools have produced, the, the tools plus corpus have produced, um, and those collocations are good if they're ones that should be in a dictionary like the Oxford Collocations Dictionary. We, we didn't use the Oxford Collocations Dictionary in the program for a number of reasons, not, last, not least because we could only do that for English and we want this to be generalised across lots of languages, but we can say, would a lexicographer have put it in a dictionary like the Oxford Collocations Dictionary? Um, well, to go back to a couple of slides, um, we, we definitely won't need broad coverage for this, we need to cover the whole language, and collocations are kind of the structure to, to do with the norms of the language. We're pretty sure that we're only going to get a good collocations dictionary if we get a good corpus, and there aren't too many dependencies. But is it valuable? That's the difficult question. Um, well, people often don't find this convincing, but I'll say it anyway. I think it's convincing. Um, it kind of is valuable because collocations dictionaries exist. It's kind of existence proof. There has been a team of professional people who've answered that question, should this go in the dictionary, in a kind of professional, systematic way. Um, so the answer is yes, in my opinion. Um, so first I'll talk about version 1 of a task and then version 2. Version 1, um, take a sample of headwords, find the collo use, the, use the, the kind of corpus processing machinery to find the collocations for the headwords, ask lexicographers are they, are they good, and then we know how good the, how good the corpus is or to be um, or, or, how, or how good the machinery is and how good the corpus is. I'll come back to how good the corpus is in a moment, in version 2. Um, so we first used this for evaluating word sketches. Um, 
do people near here know what word sketches are? Or do people, do, are there people here who don't know what word sketches are? Silence both ways, always hard to judge. I'm going to give you a little demo now, to, so that you know what word sketches are and what the, um, what the sketch engine is, which, are, which is accompanied by my handout, which is a publicity brochure, so if you want to pass those around. There, hopefully there's enough for everyone. Um, um, so, so the sketch engine is a, it's a leading corpus tool. Um, it's used for dictionary making at Oxford University Press and Cambridge University Press and quite a few other places. And what this is meant to say here is, um, I was talking to Eva about this earlier, about how all the... Um, all the former Soviet bloc countries and, all, and many others too have their institute of the X language. So lots of the institutes of the X language uh, are, are using the sketch engine for corpus making include where with X taking values of Bulgaria, Czech, Dutch, Estonian, Irish, Latvian, Slovak and Slovene. So that's, that's that little notation there. Um, it's also used in research in linguistic research and increasingly for translation and terminology work um, and teaching all of those of course um, and and we've got lots of corpora in the sketch engine um, we've got large corpora for about 60 languages um, a lot of them from the web a lot of them from other corpus collection projects um, and we've got billions of words for the major languages, and you'll be glad to uh, to know that for these purposes, Czech is an honorary major language because my colleagues are all Czech. So, um, so let's do a bit of demo. So. Now, there's always the trade-off between how much you can read from the back and how much gets on the screen. Uh, so, and it does bounce. So that that will do. So, um, so this is uh, Zapamunut. Thank you, Zapumano. Uh, uh, so we've got, this is a nice big corpus. It's, uh, it's a web crawled corp corpus crawled in 2012 um, of several billion words. Can't remember how many billion. Um, so we've got lots and lots of evidence for Zapumano. We've got getting on for half a million examples. And that means we can summarize them. Yang will confirm this is definitely not one that I've tried in advance, so I hope it's going to work now. You never quite know. But then life would be boring if we didn't uh, take, take risks occasionally. So, we, ah, that was not a good choice. Right, what I now have to do to see what went wrong? I don't think so. Um, possible. Let's see, just in case. Tension mounts. Ah, thank you. It was the trading space. So here's a summary of the behavior of Zappumano. Um, uh, the preposition so clearly it's got a strong tendency to go with na. If, you're, if, you, if we ever want to see what's going on there. So this, this is kind of heading towards a more grammatical analysis, saying what it's uh, typically picking up its subcategorization frames, and it looks like there's one, there's one, there's one strong pattern here, and everything else is, is, is noise. So we could say, if we want to see, we, we can then uh, see all the... See lots of examples of that pattern. Or go back here. Are there items here people are curious about? 
it's kind of it's, a, it's, it's always slightly strange having an audience of people who speak a language and me as the only non-speaker and me showing you things about it so it's a slightly odd situation but are, are there are there items there that people are curious about and want to feature we've added is that I can click on here to find a, a multi-word sketch so for Zapumone na, what are the common collocates for that I don't know whether that makes sense to you can also produce a distributional thesaurus find the most similar words the words which share most collocations with Zappelmanol what, what, what's the relationship between this word and and the, the input word are they, is this a... <laughs> oh. That's, um, not... An obscure dialect. Is it? It's an obscure dialect. It's not from here. Oh, it's not like Well, that's, that's really nice then, because... So what the tool succeed, immediately succeeded in finding is that this is, is a variant of the input word. <coughs> and as you'd expect with a variant, it has, it has exactly the same collocations, so it has a very high score in terms of sharing collocations. So it's, um, it isn't doing an obvious thesaurus-like thing, but it is doing something that... Is I, think, uh, I think it's uh, because uh, probably the localization system considers variants to be more Right. Mm. Right. Oh, I see. Let, what, ah. But we can also check. We can also look look that up like this. We can say if we put this in here. Do these look Moravian to you? Okay. But there is one. No, 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 sorry. I can't do No, no, no. It's L at the end. I thought it was G. Right. No. So perhaps. But it's. Would the correct infinitive for all of these be the one that we started with? Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, I will not say more about um, the niceties of different Czech lemmatizers. That's beyond my uh, aspiration. If we go back to here, um, uh, uh, the second one, that, is that kind of a straightforward case? No. Of a, no. No. Yeah, no. the third one is the imperfect before. Right. Right, so it's it's uh, it's uh, d derived morphology. It's a derivation, but it's 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 kind of yeah, mm, yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. Right, so you'd sort of expect them to have the same context collocations. And this one here is is that a near synonym of of, of, of the. Let, let, we can click to see what to see why the system thinks they belong together. We call this one a sketch diff because it talks about the difference of word sketches. So in this K 
can I tell can, can I tell Chrome not to so, uh, can you still see at the back if I make it a little bit smaller no not really no um, I must work out how to um, yeah. So we've got 35. No, I won't. Um, what, what, what this is showing us is that these two words uh, is that the items that the that these two words shared. Um, they both occurred in a sort of and/or relationship with those two. They, so they both occurred, the one and the other. That's a bit... Um, and apart from that, they didn't share very much because these are the ones that occurred with Stinut and these are the ones that occurred with Zapomenut. Um, can we get... This might be a bit more informative. So, so this is the number of occurrences with Zaponemut, and this is no with Stimut, and this is the number of occurrences with Zaponemut. So these ones are all ones that occurred with both of the with both of the uh, input verbs. This one occurred equally. These ones are a lot more likely to occur with Zaponemut if I've got them the right way around. No, with Stimut. And the ones down the bottom much more likely to occur with Zapomenut. So it's um, so um, you know, the most straightforward role for this sort of display. Uh, I have a suspicion that the negation might play a role here. That uh, this Stino actually was less Stino, like not to maybe to do something, not to meet the deadline. Right. So Stino means roughly succeeds does it yeah. oh so what it's telling us oh, so ah yes so um, yeah antonyms are very good cases of synonyms I right? that's I'm uh, uh, yeah common yeah a much observed pattern is that they yeah nice thank you um, so that's why we do the same sorts of things uh, they converses yeah um, so the same sorts of things that you forget are the kinds of things that you might succeed at Thanks. Um, anyway, so the, the kind of the most straight, I mean, the straight, if, if we go back one step further, if we go back and look again, is, is this one something like a, a synonym for Zapomenut? To try something. Oh, so they're all, they're all these verbs that take actions, events as their, as their objects and probably also clausal objects. Yeah. So we've, 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 the system is telling us something about these verbs all patterning in the same kind of way, even if it isn't straightforward. Perhaps we could, um, that's the, I won't spend too long because this is a side issue to the, uh, to the topic of the talk. I'll just, um, uh, but, but it, hopefully, you know, if you were if you were wanting to do a um, a kind of synonym analysis to say what is it about two near synonyms that are that's the same and what's different, then this will give you lots of data to start with. And it, another word, some more straight, some adjective or noun would probably have been better to illustrate that. Um, I'll just go back to the home page you get when you log on to illustrate that in the sketch engine there are the corpora that are managed by um, managed by my company um, and then they're down here there are my corpora which are the ones that you've built yourself so as well as it being a tool for using existing resources to explore them it's also a tool for um, uploading onto the onto our uploading into our tool your own you know, resources that you've created on your own computer or we've also got a nice tool called Bootcat for building, for building corpora from the web so you could also be building corpora and looking at them, exploring them in the tool that's 
that's the uh, questions about that or do I'm sure there'll be more questions later um, I'll now go back to the main text Um, so the first version of the evaluation exercise, we've had uh, 10 years of word sketches now, rather more. The first, the first product to, to use word sketches was for English and it was the Mobilian English Dictionary. I did the very first version of them in 1998 um, and the, the outcome of that first version that they were used as the starting point for a lot of the entries in the Macmillan English Dictionary that was published in 2002. Um, the feedback was that they were very helpful and um, but after all that time it seemed like it was like a, quality, a quantitative evaluation was due. So what we did was take a sample of headwords, find all the collocations Ask, and then ask the lexicographer whether the collocations are good. And we did that for four languages, Dutch, English, Japanese and Slovene. And um, we took 20 collocations per headword and asked the lexicographer, are they good? And the short answer is that two-thirds of them were. Um, and there's a paper about that from the Eurolex Lexicography Conference in 2010. Um, but when giving a first version of that paper um, it was David Weir who some of you might know who said that's no good because maybe the lexicographers are just being helpful and want to say everything's good you need to have a balance to that and really what you need to do is to measure recall as well as precision um, so they were the ones we found at the top of the list were, were mostly two thirds good but we also want to assess whether we're good at finding them in a sort of standard information retrieval and NLP way of assessing recall alongside precision. So now, then we need to move on to it. So that's really what I'm talking about now that's the new work. Version 2 is going to be quite similar. Sample of headwords, we find all the candidate collocations from everywhere. And if we found them all, and then we ask lexicographers, are they good? So first we find all the candidates, and then we ask the lexicographers, are those candidates good? And then we've got the gold standard of, what all, the, of all the collocations that we ought to have found from, um, for, a, for a headword. And then we can say that is what the output of a perfect corpus and system would be. And then we can say, how does corpus X with working with system Y score? And we can vary the corpus to see to evaluate the corpora to see which corpora are better and we can vary the system or some component of the system to evaluate the systems. So that's what, we're, that's what we've been doing. Um, in order to do it as ever you have to sharpen up what you mean by the, by a, by the you know, exactly what the task is. In this case what exactly is a collocation and we're, we've, we're taking a very um, sort of simplifying take on what a collocation is, we're going to say it's an unordered pair of lemmas, a pair of content words. Um, and a lot of the reason for doing this is in order to be able to compare lots of different systems, you, you don't want to compromise the evaluation framework by having assumptions of any particular system in the gold standard data. So we, if we'd if we'd had um, well, a word class as part of the definition of the lemma, then we would have had then we would have had problems if different systems operated with different taxonomies of word classes. If we'd had a um, a taxonomy of if we'd had uh, a grammatical relation, you know, in a collocation like um, drink tea, the relation is verb object. And so in a lot of our work, we say that's a verb-object relation. Um, but if we'd included the grammatical relation, the dependency relation here, then we would have had the problem of different systems delivering different, you, know, you kept calling the same thing different things, and it's not, it's, not sure, it's not clear if it's exactly the same thing. So that's 
the main reason why we're simply saying a, a pair, an unordered pair of lemmas. It's also quite a lot of the reason why we're only dealing with, we're, we're viewing a collocation as, a, as just, just having two words, mainly because that makes everything simpler to assess and score and compare. Um, and we're also going to not include grammar words. So if I um, um, uh, so if it's a collocation, stick up your hands is a collocation or idiom, we're not making distinctions between them, but we're going to say, we're going to rule out the grammar words, so we're going to reduce that to stick hand, unordered uh, pair of lemmas, um, because really what we're trying to do here is about the lexical words rather than the grammatical words and the grammatical structures so um, and there's nothing very elegant about using a stock list of words that we won't that we'll just rule out as being lemmas in this sense the reason we're doing it is to keep the evaluation framework as simple as possible they always get complicated anyway so um, and also we'll leave out everything capitalized um, our sample of head words uh, point I want to make here is I'm point I'm very committed to that I think lots of linguistic research goes wrong on. Um, we want to sample you know, different word classes have different kinds of behaviour. So let's sample from all word class, all, from the three main word classes. There are just three main word classes in most languages. Adverbs is a tiny category. Typically, nouns are half of what's in the dictionary, and adjectives are a quarter and verbs are a quarter, and everything else is forgettable um, in terms of quantity. Um, so we'll, we'll cover those three classes, and also words behave differently depending whether they're high frequency or medium frequency or low frequency. And um, that's an example of what they look like for English. Probably more interesting to see, for you to see what they look like in Czech, for which I have to make a particular expression of gratitude to Milos Jakubicek because he sent me a version of this slide today saying I put in all the diacritics and I've corrected seven spelling mistakes that I've succeeded in making when copying across some Czech words into here so thank you Milos for that um, so this is within these categories high, medium and low frequency nouns, ad adjectives and verbs these are selected at random because it's another, another methodological point not to choose examples, example words because they're interesting ones, but to try and cover the language well by taking random samples. Um, now here is the part that was the biggest challenge. How do we find all the collocations for each of those hundred words? I, that was a subsample of them on the slide. Um, well, broadly, fi um, take all the corpora we had um, and use our system for finding collocations on various parameters and put all those candidates in a big pot and um, also any that we found in any dictionaries. We looked through all the dictionaries we could, um, or we, we all, the, all the dictionaries that had collocations in to add them into the pot. And then we come up with candidates and that's how many candidates we decided to use and those are the candidates that was the number of candidates that then we asked three judges is it is it a collocate should it should it go in a collocations dictionary or not so that was the key question we did it as an interface like this so the lexicographer so this is for the english noun circuit um, so the first, the first one is separate, a separate circuit. Well, me, uh, for me as a native English speaker, I say that there's nothing very collocational about that, so I'll put the bad, I'll tick the bad box there. The car and the circuit, the, to the car and the circuit, no, that one's pretty bad. 
circuits are isolated. Yeah, here we're talking, you know, as a native speaker, it's immediately apparent that we're talking about circuits in the electronics sense and an isolated circuit. Yes, isolating circuits is something you often do want to do. That's, that's collocational. Tick the yes, the good box there. Um, KM, that's noise. That's bad. Uh, uh, resist the resistance of the, cir the, the, cir the resistor in the circuit is probably good. Yeah, I think I'd. Um, circuit board is definitely good. That's uh, weather tested noun. Um, closed circuit TV. Notice we've got we're throwing in all the different meanings. So closed circuit TV isn't the same meaning of circuit as this. This is an electronics one. This is a general social organization one. This is a legal one. A circuit registrar is a kind of judge in England. And um, undulating circuit will be a, a circuit of a racetrack. So it's all different kinds of circuit. That's fine. That's not the topic here. Um, so of these, I'd go through and three or four of them are correct and the others are not. Um, for English, we had the good fortune to um, actually get hold of lexicographer who'd worked on the Oxford Collocations Dictionary um, to be our judges. The Czech we didn't have, so we'd used three, so three computational linguistics students did it. We were asking each of the judges to make 30,000 judgments. Judgments being ticking good or bad in one of those boxes, like the previous slide. So it was a few days' work, so it wasn't a vast amount of work, but it was non certainly non trivial. Any questions there? Or? Um, this is the intertagger agreement we got. Tasks like this don't attract very high intertagger agreement. Um, Oh, well, before I get on to intertagger agreement, um, firstly, there's a simple question of uh, how many of those candidates were good? You made 30,000 judgments. How many of them were good and how many were the bad? Um, and the range for the three Czech taggers was between 9% and 24%, and the range for the three English taggers was between 16% and 26%. Um, the... And these are the agreement figures which, you know, there's lots of work in this area which finds Kappa scores for those of you who are more know about this literature. Pairwise agreement is an, easy, is an easy to understand kind of measure, how many of the times they agree, but um, it gets a bit distorted because an awful lot of these, people say no an awful lot of the time. So if you get people saying no most of the time, then you'd expect just randomly that they both said no on the same ones a lot. So Kappa adjusts for that. And uh, these um, other people can assess. People have different discussions about how good a Kappa score has to be for it to sort of be good enough. Um, and I think that's out of date. I think we... No, I'm not... Uh, I'm not sure whether the results I'm showing were on this convention, but we'll call it good if two out of the three people said it was good, or if we, if we need 100% agreement. Um, it would, I don't think it'll make a critical difference. So that was intertagger agreement. Um, we wanted to find, you know, the, the rationale, the, the logic of the approach is that we wanted to find all the good candidates. Um, so we wanted to see if, after we've shown the lexicographers these 500 or 250 or 125 candidate collocates, and they've told us which ones are good, did we find all of them? And if we'd set those thresholds higher, if we'd asked the lexicographers to look at twice as many examples, would we have, using everything else the same, would we have found more candidates? So what, this assesses it by saying, well if we, by breaking the, 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 the 500 candidates, or into, or however many candidates there were, breaking them into bins of the, the 50th ones from the, which the system says are the best candidates, and then the next 50th, and then the next 50th. And so for each of those 50ths, um, did we get, how many of them were judged good by the lexicographers? 
and the black figures are English and the grey figures are Czech because the Czech lexicographers reckon there were much less good candidates all around. Um, so what this shows is that when we had our top candidates were judged to be good a lot of the time and as you'd expect as we went down the list of the automatically generated candidate list so so the number of candidates we found you know the hit rate declined and declined and declined um, but it hasn't really got down to zero here if we'd found all the good collicuts then there's a point here where it would just be where there wouldn't be any more so it would be zero 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 so the fact that we've clearly got a tail here with a non-zero tail is suggesting that we haven't really succeeded in our goal of finding all the good collocates. There's still some lurking out there that we, that we didn't find using this method. Oh, so this is a slide as before. I've only got the English one this time, not the um, Czech one to show roughly how many good collocates, you know, how many gold standard collocates there were for some of these words. So for building, I think that was a word where we had most approved, you know, lexicographic, lexicographer approved collocates, we had 199, um, whereas some words, a word like commoner just had four. Um, so to review where we are now, We've taken a sample of head words, we've found all the candidate collocates that we could, we've asked the lexicographers are, they, lexicographers, are they good? And now we've got a gold standard, which would be the output of a perfect corpus plus system. So now we can move on to this part. How does corpus X and system Y score? These are the corpora that we used for Czech and for English. Uh, the, the corpora that we used oh, we, uh, in the evaluation, we, these are mostly the corpora we used in the um, evaluation were also the corpora that we used to find the collocations in the first place, except we didn't use Oxford English corpus or Web to find collocations. I'll come back to that shortly. Um, as always, running language technology experiments, there are lots of parameters as you try and work out the best way to do this. Um, a lot of the parameters are centered around the precision recall trade-off. Um, so now we can get the system to give us a list of candidates and we can evaluate them against the gold standard. So one question is how long should that list be that we evaluate against the gold standard? Um, and the, usually the best parameter settings there seem like it was for the high frequency words 100 and for the mid frequency words 50 and for the low frequency words 25 but there were other options as well. Um, what metric to use to put precision and recall together? Um, a standard, the standard one is F1 but that weights precision and recall equally. Um, my colleagues have convinced me that F5, which gives you know, the, the, the bigger challenge, the, the key challenge for finding, the key challenge here is finding all the collocations, so we should give more emphasis to recall than precision. Um, another parameter is what statistics shall we sort by? Um, with, with, there's a long literature about what the best statistic is to find collocations. Is it, is it um, uh, with candidates being uh, things like the uh, mutual information and the dice coefficient to see which two words have a strong connection with, with each other, really belong together. But there's also some literature which says actually if you just look for the words where the collocation is most frequent, or look for the most frequent collocations rather than doing any adjustment, that's best. Um, so we tried both of those. Also, it's helpful to have a cutoff. If things only occur once, we probably don't want to consider them as candidates. So we, or, and so we could have that minimum hits cut off as one or five or ten. And here are the English results. Um, amongst quite a range of corpora and parameter settings. Um, these are the, the three 
top corpora with these settings for precision. The British National Corpus, a corpus we built to sort of match the British National Corpus called the New Model Corpus and the 12 billion words N1010. These are the three best corpora from the point of view of recall. And clue where there's an enormous corpus of uh, 70 billion words that um, has crawled from the web by um, Carnegie Mellon University, which we put into the sketch engine. I'm quite proud of that because it's so big. <laughs> and then the, uh, the, 12, the, the 2012 and the 2008 versions of our 1010 corpora. Um, as you'd expect with the precision scores are highest when you set the thresholds quite when you don't look at too many candidates so you just look at the top candidates like the 20 top candidates is what that 20 is and the um, and when you also say well we're only going to look at the uh, look at things that are uh, collocations that occur more than 10 times in the British National Corpus so that's good for emphasizing precision contrary wise if you set the frequency threshold at three and say, well, we'll actually look at all the collocations, that's what that dash means there, all the collocations meeting the other conditions, then um, here, for example, you get a colossal list of 90,000 collocations of which 5.4, um, of which only 5.4, only one, of which 1 in 20 is good, but we get 90% of the whole of all that we wanted to get. When we put the two... Um, the, the precision and recall together in the in the F5 score, the high scoring corpus is N1010 12 with um, with a, a frequency cutoff of five. Also, using the all of these use the uh, raw frequency rather than a more complicated statistic for deciding whether something was a um, collocation or not. And um, so, in for, in this line here, this is our sort of top results. We've got 18% precision, 77% recall, which is, you know, and so we're finding with, F, with that F5 score. That was for English. I should have spent longer on the check. Oh, no. But I've... Oh, hang on. Something's gone wrong then. Here we tried, we used, we tried parsing the chess corpus with several different tools. So we're here, the, all, all these three highest precision results are versions of the chess corpus. Am I pronouncing it right? Chess? For the. Um, so we've got a change here in that the statistic that's serving us best for high precision for check is the, um, the log dice a, 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 a statistic based on the dice coefficient for finding the best candidate collocations and um, so, that, so the, the parsers are doing best there, parsers on the chess corpus are doing best for um, for precision um, but when we for recall the very large corpus does best and it still does best when we're combining the um, combining precision and recall. Yeah. What is the reason for this big difference between uh, precision recall and for some yes for, for almost all the corporate? Well, well, depending on between recall between these two. Big difference, yeah. Well, that's it, I mean this on these settings. Um, if I just go back to the English, because it's, uh, I know where I am better. I mean, this has said we're going to view the results set. We're going to set these parameters so the results set has a colossal 90,000 items in it, of which 5.4% were good ones, but we got 90% of the good ones. So that, that's got a very big result set, whereas this, this line up here is, it's only, the results set's only 1,000 
Look, the actual good results I should have given on some slide. There were about um, 4,000 good results for each language. So this number is a lot smaller than 4,000, so the maximum recall we could have got if they were all good would only have been 25%, whereas that number is much bigger. So the maximum precision we could have got was only 5%. This is comparing parsers. So this is the, this is the same corpus in in um, but annotated differently. This one is a um, a shallow uh, a, 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 what we call a sketch grammar, which is a um, we've identified the grammatical relations, identified the collocations using a shallow grammar over the uh, uh, regular expressions over part of speech tags um, and malt parsers from is you know, a well known general I think, I think malt and MST parsers are both have been applied to lots of languages and lots of and, uh, and they're sort of not specially local products um, set and sint I should have Prepare this bit. Yeah, right. Yeah, and does set also? Or I'm not sure. I've got I've got a feeling they're two different parsers, um, with designed in different ways, but both from Bruno. Um, so what we um, is and it's kind of surprisingly the um, what have I got the the. We get the um, the highest F five score. So combining precision and recall, we do best with the with the shallow grammar rather than the um, rather than the, the sort of higher technology for, uh, full parsers to tend to get a full parse for each sentence um, and. Now, the precision is that there's not so much difference in the precision here. The, the 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 sketch grammar approach gets slightly lower precision than the other than a couple of the others, and the same as two, the same as two, and lower than slightly lower than two, but gets quite a lot, quite substantially higher recall. So that's rather nice for us. But then it's all, always a bit suspicious when the home team comes top in the evaluation, but. Um, So that's comparing those parsers. Um, again, we get this pattern where the dice coefficient is good for precision, but the simple frequency method is good for recall. Um, one, oh, um, in English, one corpus that is about two billion words and is quite carefully prepared and has got quite a lot of has got a lot of investment in it so we'd expect it to be good but doesn't occur at any point on the on the top three list is the Oxford English corpus um, and uh, it had, in fact it had quite a low score um, and we we have a, a sinking. We had a sinking feeling that the reason for that was that it wasn't one of the corpora used in the an original process to create the gold standard. So we did some more experiments there, where we said, well, what, colloca what collocations would have been in the gold standard if we'd used the Oxford English corpus to create it? Um, so, it was, so we we reran processes and it was an extra task for the judges, um, and it turned out that 19% of the new candidates were good, or the, you know, the the strongest new of the strongest new candidates were good. So the conclusion. So this is as in the as in the graph, which didn't quite get to the zero line. The conclusion whether we find all good coordinate, good candidate, good collocations is sadly no. Um, and the only response, you know, how we can respond to that, how, how does this corpus evaluation paradigm work despite this problem that we didn't find all the good, good candidates? Well, I think the, a way it can still be made to work, it, it works if you've got all the 
corpora that you want to evaluate sort of at the beginning of the exercise. But if you want to add a new corpus into the set of corpus to be evaluated, then we'll have to do some just-in-time evaluation. Adding the new corpus to the, to the set, um, take the same headwords and the same candidate finding algorithm and parameters and find candidates from the new corpus and then judge them and then rerun the evaluation in that way. So. You know, the, the, the nicest thing in these evaluation systems is if you can just press a button repeatedly, repeatedly and see what gets you the best answers. Here there's quite a bit more work involved, so this, is, you know, this isn't as neat a result as we would have hoped. Um, and we're still in the process of applying that just-in-time method to the OEC, to the Oxford English Corpus, and the, um, and the monster big one, and the, uh, the, the clue web corpus. So um, we're mostly there to do it, uh, we're completing the OEC task. Um, what we're uh, the, the other thing that I'm keenest to do is to start using this stuff. It's all in place now, and we are do, for English and Czech, and we are in a. Um, a situation where we're forever wondering what are the best parameters for web corpus construction. You know what we've got this the the. The um, deduplication process has various parameters. The, there's always the question of where you start a crawl and what difference that makes, and different crawling strategies and different processing tools. So all of these should be quite possible to evaluate. There's, it's hard not to get circular when saying what collocations are. Um, so collocate, sometimes it's tempting to say collocations are what um, are the words that go together most often, and then it becomes a bit circular because if you've got the right corpus and the right tools then that's the definition of collocation you'll be finding them so um, um, I, I can't say I've been that convinced by things that come from linguistics about collocations I mean uh, work like Melchuk's that classifies a lot of collocations well it's, it's helpful to classify them but it doesn't tell you what is or isn't one because there might be some that fall between the between the different categories um, other sort of work is forever a bit t torn between wanting to be statistical and wanting to be sort of more theory driven um, what, where I come to out of that is um, is the dictionaries of dictionaries have, have, have really you know have made it make claims in their pages about what are collocations and what aren't, so that's actually a, a better starting point because it isn't, it, you know, it's reasonably data-driven and it's reasonably, uh, and, and they're kind of aware of the theory but not overwhelmed with it because, you know, it, it's clearly a strong pattern of language that most words just have a few other words they do go through, or lots of words just have not so many other words that they usually go with. And... Um, so this is so I'm I shy away from the question about the theoretical status of collocations. I just think it's they've done it at Oxford and they've done it at Macmillan and it's useful for our task. So I don't think that's. <laughs> there I <are>, can imagine. <laughs> so um, yeah, well, I don't quite get uh, uh, what, what is. Uh, what is actually evaluated? Um, it's hard to measure recall in Sketch Engine. And uh, it, but it looks that, that you try to evaluate corpora and they recall in Sketch Engine without having evaluated the Sketch Engine itself. Uh, or well, there's only... There's not so many bits of the Sketch Engine which were which are sort of central to what we've done here. Um, the, you know, this is so the sketch engine is kind of a bit aside to this evaluation exercise because all the... Um, um, you know, the uh, so, for, for example, for, for all the pauses, then we can say... Here's the here's the dependency relation between uh, between a verb and a noun. So that means the verb and the noun. That's one occurrence for those that verb and that noun going together. We'll count up all those occurrences of lemmas going together, and that's the 
that's the set of collocations in the corpus so it doesn't depend on the sketch engine at all it's just what I'm saying here and then the equations that we use they're all you know, they, they don't depend on the sketch engine either um, so I, I mean what so I mean this is I think, I think it's I mean it, I, I, I've certainly convinced myself that um, this is telling us that the um, that to, to catch you know that we can do pretty well that the corpus like n10 10 10 12 does pretty well at catching the great bulk of the collocations for words without without there being too much of a, you know at us you know you, you can get a very long list of collocations from n10 10 10 12 and you've got over three quarters of them and um, 18% of the things in that list will be collocations. So it's sort of saying, and, and that figure is, is, you know, is going to be that much better than this one. So, it's, so we're succeeding in evaluating the, the corpora in that way. Okay, so well, um, if there are no further questions or remarks to be made, so let me thank Professor uh, Kelly Gareth again for his talk here. And um, well, we do hope that uh, this is not the last time uh, we have you here. So oh. we are looking forward to it. I have heard that this is the third time when Adam was uh, in Prague. When you are in Prague. Yeah. But, uh, he has never been in this building, so I think we have to reverse the frequencies oh. somehow. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much again. And as for our next meeting, I'm very uh, sorry to say that uh, there is nothing fixed yet for the next Monday. Um, it's almost sure that we will not meet next Monday, but you will hear from us on email. Uh, the reason is that uh, the, uh, what we were supposed to do was um, a discussion with people from the uh, I mean lawyers who were supposed to inform us about open access and I don't know what, uh, some legal questions, uh, but they uh, cannot come next Monday. So uh, we will inform you in time whether we get some uh, replacement uh, for that particular day. So thank you very much again and see you if not next Monday so for our next meeting. Thank you.